Can you see me? Yeah, you're muted. Still muted. Okay, there you go. How about that? Can you hear me? We're good now. What's going on? Oh, oh, hold on. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Oh, shit. Got an echo. There we go. Uh, I can. Yeah, you're good. Doesn't matter. What do you mean? Oh, because uh, in StreamYard, you're. Um... You're like invisible, but like I can see you on the, you know. The actual stream that means everybody else is seeing you all right hey chat can, can anyone in chat see me can you verify that you can in fact see me right now that, it's, did you activate the camera in discord and then um thank you valkyrie of the north so I really appreciate the uh reassurance that i can be perceived you you, you are me actually me. perceived i, I promise a, a, am I a, a being that is being perceived? <laughs> I still hear the Shit. lo fi coming through. Are we keeping that on? Can I turn that off? Just turn it down a little bit. All right, all right, fine, fine. Well, on, chapter is <laughs> not an avatar reference. <laughs> bring it down just to there. Just add i just need just a little tad. bit of range between that and our speaking voices just a tad All just right. a little bit of a range is what i what i'm requesting <laughs> what's up everybody how's everybody feeling on this sunday evening i for one am completely exhausted i just finished all of my finals i just got my last grade back for my finals i passed my classes with all a's i now have a couple weeks where i can okay Cool. Good to hear that you're good, Valkyrie. Couple, couple people were all good. Glad to hear it. Uh, just got all A's in my classes. I have about four weeks before that I can, I guess, call it a rest before I have to start classes again. So that's a relief. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Pat. I knew you were going to do it. Sam, what's up? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we will... Uh, uh, hopefully my intention is to kind of ramp up um our reading output so we can kind of summarize this book on a roll um so that we can kind of get this book uh finished up a little bit quicker than anticipated we're going one chapter at a time now hopefully now that i don't have all this schoolwork to do every week we can ramp that up to two chapters per stream um so that we can hopefully finish this book in i think it would be less than two weeks um how are you doing johnny I'm doing all right. I'm I'm feeling way better than I did the last time where I was. Uh, did you announce to the to the chat that you were sick last time, or did we did was that our secret? No, I'm like absolutely certain I announced more than once. <laughs> I feel like I'm dying and that like <laughs> I feel like shit. But uh, yeah, welcome to Subversive History, uh, an anti-capitalist, anti-fucking imperialist, anti-colonial whatever stream uh it's kind of like a book club podcast type deal where uh we read books with you yeah speaking of which here's a pdf to the counter revolution of 1776 i i think i forget to post this in chat most times but it's my intention to probably post this in chat at least once or twice per stream so that if anyone is interested in reading along with us contributing to the dialogue um please feel free we absolutely encourage this uh me and johnny are not scholars we are not experts um we are just uh, a couple guys with webcams and the same book that read a book and talk about it um so anyone can literally uh participate in this um there is no barrier for entry whatsoever i don't have this book i don't own a physical copy <laughs> all i have is the pdf i i i have at least i, I have a uh i have a copy i have a, the, the paperback i'm a big uh i'm a big paper i'm a big hard copy hard copy yeah. guy it's just like you know i have so many books that like i uh, it's i spent a lot of money on books right this actually was a gift for my friends out in colorado the fourth world um sounds cool it, it's really fucking cool and i can't wait and it's like a this is like a re um what's the word when they like re put out a book reissue 
Yeah, it's like a reissue uh, with a forward by uh, Glenn Coltard, the guy that wrote uh, Red Skin, White Masks. Also sounds cool. Lots of cool yeah. stuff that we're talking about. Um, but particularly, the cool thing that we're going to be focusing on today is the Counter Revolution of 1776, Chapter 3, which is called Revolt, uh, with the subtext Africans conspire with the French and the Spanish. Um, now, if you've been following with us up until this point, um, you would know that we've kind of been like repeatedly touching on these topics that are influential to this subject, such as um, the slave trade, the ensuing insurrectionary movements of the slaves resisting their captivity, um, the white fright and white flight that is caused by slaves deciding they will no longer be slaves um and then how that affects like s s uh, slavery in the caribbean and how it pushes it north into the mainland but then the similar things are happening in the mainland so now there's this kind of like white panic with the european settlers to bring in more white people so that they can balance the population so that the african population doesn't become too significant to the point where they can lead a very significant insurrectionary movement and uh, but then because of this desperation for more white people they bring in kind of like the more at least at that time considered unsavory elements of whiteness so you have irish catholics who are already not so keen on the english you bring in french people you bring in spanish people you bring in jewish people you bring in welsh people you bring in scots people and the thing is is that these are demographics that are more likely to potentially also maybe have a sympathetic view with the africans in being um uh discriminated against by um the english uh upper class and then also you have obviously the colonial um complexion of the united states which is not purely um english it is english it is french it is spanish it is dutch um it, and there's also the indigenous factor as well who are also none the um none the appreciative of uh the european uh colonists and settlers who also just may be interested in uh a little bit of a you know a little bit of conspiring uh with uh their african um contemporaries peers in this um you know eurocentric peers in, in colonialism <laughs> yeah exactly it kind of um, just seems like the only people that are like technically really benefiting right are the are they even like are, are rich english colonists rich rich that's, protestant colonists well that's the thing here is what we're examining now through this book is this tenuous um grasp that even the like the most the, the largest beneficiaries of the slave trade is that like so the last factor that we didn't discuss was the glorious revolution, which has moved a greater uh, amount of power out of the monarchy and into the parliament and thus into like private merchants. So you have the thing, the massive uh, royal slave trading um, company, the, the Royal Africa Company, which has now taken a significant backseat to private traders so uh, of slaves. Excuse me. Um, so even like the most, it's like a constant battle like you could call it you could look at it in terms of like a dialectic between like the the rapacious need for um exploitable forced labor versus um oh, are we getting spammed again nah I'll, I'll take care of it keep going boom you know we made it you know we're making it when we're getting spammed um the 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 ravenous need to reap profits through the commodification of human flesh and the you know low wages or non-existent wages that you can pay to the low overhead let's call it overhead not wages um the overhead the, to ha having chattel slavery versus the political social um societal instability of having what, what slave what owning slaves inevitably causes um you know these aren't animals these are not you know cows that you can just have out in a field and they have no like um you know conscious 
percept perception of their own worth and their own abilities to revolt. These are human beings, and these are human beings with a capacity that is not that of an animal, a mental capacity that is not that of an animal, that are extremely capable of organizing, um, learning languages, um, establishing their own communities, and may just be willing to remove the head of the person that is preventing them from doing that. Which we're going to talk about, um, you know, uh, we have some examples of that happening now. We talked about examples of that happening in the uh, previous situations, uh, such as in the Caribbean, where there were some significant revolts, such as the Maroons in Jamaica, as well as Tacky's revolt. Was Tacky's revolt also in Jamaica? Um, you know, what? let me double check. I think that this was Jamaica. This is though. a this this uh this uh unfortunate fellow here is uh meeting the just desserts that uh come from exploiting slaves yep. and that is that the cover jamaica. of the book it was also in jamaica okay so you have the maroons and the tacky revolt which are which are like two of like the most significant caribbean uh slave revolts and this is why you have europeans in the mainland colony clutching their pearls and fearing uh more and more africans coming and then there's like this like weird way that they're trying to like understand it uh like well no if we just bring the slaves directly from africa and they don't go to the caribbean they're not going to be tainted with insurrection and uh that's also not the case we're going to learn that even in the african mainland even in the um you know africans that are being complicit and benefiting from the slave trade there's even revolts happening in africa against that so there is no um you know uh less um less combative slave um this type of insurrectionary kind of violence like is a necessary reaction it is a it is a it is an equal reaction to enslaving people it, it will always manifest yeah, it, it kind of seems like if you just use and abuse people for like years at a time and treat them as if they are like no different than uh, like, you know, uh, like a like a like a hammer or a shovel that, uh, you know, or like a domesticated yeah. animal. Like that's the thing. I think that's right. like a more more apt comparison is that you have these like plantation owners and they probably look at it the same way as you may you know gather cows or or pigs or something like that right. for the use of your like domestic agriculture purposes and they're as if they don't have the mental capacity to learn language communicate uh c c you know per perceive their own you know freedom and their own um you know ability to organize a society and enact violence against those that are preventing them from doing that So, yeah. Sorry, I'm like trying to organize everything here. Okay. All right. Um, so just to get into like kind of how the, I think I laid like a little bit of like a groundwork and hopefully I'm not repeating myself too much, but if you hear me repeating myself, it's because that is actually the, the content of this book. It starts with an intro that really lays out the main topics. And then it's kind of like a canvas in which like the, the, it's just stroke after stroke of paint. Like, it's just like kind of like building off of these like initial tenants that we are that i just kind of like went over so we're just kind of going to provide more and more evidence and historical context for these um factors that are and variables that are going to ultimately leave up to the 1776 declaration of independence uh, which is seldomly discussed or maybe almost never discussed in our um hist history of the united states and how we came to be an independent nation Oh no, I can tell you just because like history has always been like one of my favorite subjects. So especially in uh, like, you know, middle school and high school and stuff like I remember going over the Revolutionary War. Right. And I can tell you right now that like I do not recall ever any teacher, you know, bringing up slavery as like a contested issue or as one that played an integral part of the revolutionary war it right. most of the focus is, is solely on right um the the lack of representation and like you know the house of burgesses or whatever the fuck it is yeah. um it was mostly about like you know taxation without representation mm -hmm. and all that other dumb shit the tea party you know it's about the tea yeah. party yeah exactly it, it, it's um, never on you know anything to do with slavery and nothing to do with like um, the English being against expansion of the colony into indigenous territories. 
Right. And also, I feel like this also adds a lot of context to what the abolitionist movement actually was. I mean, I'm sure there was um, more altruistic individuals that did advocate for abolitionism, but this paints a very different picture of uh, at least London's official stance towards abolitionism, where this was not some kind of thing where a bunch of people in London were uh, developing an enlightened perspective no. to um, not, you know, treat Africans as second class citizen or as like human property, but more so the institution of slavery was becoming more and more untenable in terms of something that they could safely um, control. It was becoming more and more of this like hot potato or this more and more this like this this rising pressure cooker that was going to explode and you know eventually they were going to lose profits they were going to lose lives they were going to lose you know it was becoming more dangerous to it was becoming more dangerous to maintain than it was to just abolish um and that seems to be at least from what this book is describing the main push for abolitionism was not like this is wrong but it's more so like we can no longer safely profit from this yeah no it, it every other page is basically just another rebellion right <laughs> <laughs> like every other page is another and like the one that like he opens up the chapter with right <laughs> is one that i've never even heard of i've never heard of this i never knew Born and raised in new jersey right like literally like i can where, where i grew up there are certain hills where like you can see manhattan you see the city skyline right um and i have never heard of this even from like uh, uh people i knew that grew up in new york talking about uh the events of the 6th of april 1712 um fires also illuminated the sky in lower manhattan what had happened was the what that a few dozen determined africans armed with guns hatchets knives and other poor loined weapons gathered in an orchard at the rear of a house in the city's east ward burst into an outhouse set ablaze that building and then ambushed the settlers who rushed to extinguish the fire preferring death to capture a number of the rebels fled to the countryside and committed suicide before they could be detained while others were arrested approximately 70 about 21 were executed subsequently nine settlers had been murdered but this did not arrest the continuing plotting of africans against the authorities at times in league with the french and spanish and the indigenous since the total population of this future metropolis was reportedly a mere 6307 at the time of whom no fewer than 945 uh, were Negroes. Disrupting the status quo violently was not as difficult as it was to become. Alas, once again, we have not found the avenging angel. <laughs> Seems rather shitty business. So, yeah, and if you're just looking at, like, for a quick overview of the situation, which, again, also, I never heard about this either, especially because um, it's so, um, it's so, it, it, it's a very, it's also very driven into us that this was, like, a very southern issue. Like, slavery was something that yeah. existed down there, and, like, you know what I mean? Like, we were, we were more enlightened. That's why when the Civil War happened, we were against slavery. And when I say we, it's because I'm from New Jersey. That's what I mean by we. Like, we look at it as, like, you know, those were, like, these, um, you know, um, confederate defectors who were an aberration of the otherwise um you know virtuous united states patriots um and then this goes to just kind of show that even up until 1712 or at least that's as far as that we've gotten thus far you know what i mean you can see slavery paying a major role in new york and actually we're going to get into um some things that even New York was doing in terms of like taxing and tariffs that was actually greatly incentivizing bringing slaves there from Charleston. Um, but yeah, you can just see New York slave result, re, re, revolt of uh, 1712 was an uprising in New York City. Um, 23 black slaves killed nine whites and injured another six before they were stopped. More than 70 black people arrested and jailed. That seems a little disparate, doesn't it? There's, a little uh, bit. It was a, a revolt of 23 slaves and then 70 black people were arrested and jailed. Um. Right. And the idea that um, they committed suicide, I don't know. All there, There's a lot of rather dubious, um, you know, information going on in this event yeah. that like, you know, I'm sure we'll never actually get um, 
So this is like also legitimate. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll never get like what actually happened. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, slavery in the city differed from that of other colonies because there were no plantations producing cash crops. Slave works as domestic servants, artisans, dock workers, and various skilled laborers. They also worked among free black people, a situation that did not exist in Southern plantations. This is also something that you're going to see here as well is that, you know, as slavery progresses and as you have, um, you know, slaves that have been in the colonies longer and have been in adjacent to um, European individuals, um, because African people are not mentally deficient, they are, uh, they will pick up on the language, they will learn English, they will learn French, they will learn Spanish, and thus they will communicate with one another, and they will communicate that, guess what, in France, there's Maroons in Jamaica, uh, in France, what the fuck am I saying? In Jamaica, there are Maroons that have, like, fought and actually signed treaties with the British for their own freedom. So this starts inspiring insurrection insurrectionist movements throughout, um, throughout the colonies. Right. So then they have to start worrying about like, don't teach your slaves English. Make sure that they can't. And this is something that Frederick Douglass talks about quite a bit is that the, this is this um, intentional repression of literacy. Right. I mean, like the only thing they can think of to offset any of this is to consistently try and scheme of a way to get more white people as this like, you know, identity is just, you know, um, very like rapidly you know like uh i guess like being a, a applied to people that like or like what prior to the colony you know less than you know 100 200 years ago uh were seen as uh less than people you know what i mean like you were talking about earlier like the 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 french the spanish the irish the the welsh the scots you know um and he even says uh, the, the the governor during this New York slave revolt, who was Scott, uh, I think he was like a what, Protestant Scott or whatever, Governor Robert Hunter of New York, who happened to be Scottish, was irate about the tumult of April 1712, denouncing this bloody conspiracy designed to destroy as many of the inhabitants as they could. The chief executive had wondered if brutalizing Africans had a downside. Really? That like how how <laughs> how does it take yeah, you like this just kind of coming to this realization like wait a minute you know what i mean like could it be us are we the baddies yeah, yeah. and he's like not even like remorseful uh, apparently because like at as uh the executions are going on he did not apologize for the fact that among the disreputably handled detainees was a woman with child nor did it ruffle his sangrifoid I don't even. <laughs> There's swear, Gerald Horn doing it again, man. Bro, on, I swear on, to God, it's because Jerry. he's reading on, like these ancient texts from like 300 years ago, right? Um, and it's just using all kinds of words that he himself has got to be just like, what the fuck is that? You know, um, that some were burnt, others were hanged, and broke on ye wheel with an e. I don't know what that means. What the the ye wheel? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to break someone on ye wheel is. I I assume it's probably just like a form of torturing someone to death. Yeah, vault the wheel. That's what I that's what I thought. That's what I thought. I got this little video here. You want to throw? Oh, you want to watch this about the revolt? It's only two minutes long, just to kind of give us a a, a third perspective. Yeah, see it. Here's your Black History Minute. New York City may have a reputation for being a socially progressive place to live, but during the 18th century, it was a major hub for the North American slave trade, with thousands of men, women, and children passing through the slave market that operated in the heart of what is now the financial district. On the night of April 6, 1712, this came to a head when a group of New York slaves took up arms and revolted against I love this picture. I, I don't know why. I want to get this framed in my house right here. <laughs> <laughs> this dude like realizing like fuck. <laughs> like it was then he realized he fucked yeah, he up. had fucked up. Yeah, <laughs> it was at this point he realized he fucked up. It's their captors. Between twenty-five and fifty blacks congregated at midnight in New York City, New York. With guns, swords, and knives in hand, the slaves first set fire to an outhouse, then fired shots at several white slave owners 
who had raced to the scene to fight the fire. By the end of the night, nine whites were killed and six whites were injured. The next day, the governor of New York ordered the New York and Westchester militias to, quote, drive the island. In the end, 27 people were captured hiding in a swamp near modern day Canal Street. And the governor, Robert Hunter, reported that six men committed suicide rather than facing trial. Although a handful of captured slaves were spared, the majority was sentenced to brutal public executions, including being burned alive and being hung by chains in the center of town. In the years after the slave revolt, life got harsher for enslaved New Yorkers. The city enacted strict laws preventing slaves from gathering in large groups or even holding a firearm. I hope y'all catch that. Slave owners could be a slave for no reason at all, so long as they weren't killed or maimed. Although New York eventually outlawed slavery in 1799, it remained an intrinsic part of city life until after the Civil War. Black History Minute salutes the 1712 slaves of New York for standing up against their oppressors. Salute. Um, so yeah, so that just how much I, I, I was thinking about this while I was watching, especially after we watched read this a couple times. Do you think he got that summarization of that from the book? I, I think so because it's it almost like word for word, exactly. Yeah, like it followed the 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 linear like uh you know progression of events, like very, very um parallel to the book. So I just realized yeah. that now when I was watching it. I'm sorry if for being redundant here, but you know, it's we this book, here at subversive history we here at subversive history um <laughs> endorse slave insurrections i don't know about y'all we uh venerate uh slave slave revolts here so yeah. um if you uh, don't appreciate us uh venerating slave revolts then maybe you know check out another stream i don't know there's there's plenty on here it's, there's plenty there's on here that aren't <laughs> venerating slave revolts so you know what i mean uh you could, like, uh, you know, I'm sure Vosh is playing, uh, you know, um, Bloodborne or uh, some type of video game. You can watch that. I legitimately forget constantly that Vosh uses this fucking platform. Oh, he might not. I don't know. He might be. He might have been banned. I'm not sure. I doubt it. I feel like we we would have heard about it. All right, so. Now that's kind of setting the stage here. Now, if you if you remember what we were talking about in um, previous chapters, right? Um, we we covered really heavily about um, you know Caribbean revolts. Now we're starting to see in South Carolina, in Virginia, in Rhode Island, in Massachusetts, and now even in New York City, we have slave revolts. We have we have slave insurrection fomenting so um you know this is becoming more and more of a concern especially with the stories of everything that was happening in the caribbean um you know frightening these uh the european settlers so now they want to you know figure out it says right here from the book this is just a quick snip i, I promise you guys i'm so sorry i'm, I'm not lying I'm, I'm honest to you every time that i speak to you uh, I read this entire chapter. I finished it roughly. Don't trust him, chat. He's a liar, minutes. chat. He's a liar. I, I read it roughly 10 minutes before I got on the stream and spoke to you. Um, I, uh, I had an incredibly busy week this week with finals and everything. I finished this chapter and um, I'm just kind of like reiterating it to you now. So I don't have like massive paragraphs highlighted, but just to um, support what I just said, this is a quote from the book london then had to determine if the model of development involving mass enslavement of africans was viable though this piercing thought had yet to penetrate the consciousness of most settlers so you have london kind of seeing the writing on the wall which is in uh you know um slave trader blood you know, which is creating their calligraphy on the wall um they're seeing is what settlers are not because the settlers are still uh, making money hand over fist now that the RAC has diminished because of the glorious revolution and they are raking in record profits because of this new era of like nascent capitalism that exists in this huge trade of humans so they're not as sympathetic to this idea that this whole fucking you know um 
industry of slavery may be coming unwound. Um, they're more so just have blinders on just for the acquisition and sale. And how can we just, how can we keep this industry thrive, thriving, but also keep our heads attached to our body? There's even a point in this um, book where I believe Gerald Horn equates it to having a death wish, the way that they yes. continue to pursue this industry. They said it was as if they had a death wish trying to see if i can pull that up because like i highlighted that because i was like yes this <laughs> <laughs> ba, 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 ba. Uh, dead air dead air dead air <laughs> all right so um then you know obviously and i've we brought this up several times and i'm gonna bring it up again because this is how this book is written this again um causes you causes the settle all the colonies and the settlements in uh the european in the in the american mainland to be like we need to bring more white people at any cost at any rate i don't care who they are i don't care if they're criminals i don't care if they're fucking dirty catholics i don't care if they're scots or irishes bring them we need them we need more white people and that and that's it point blank no 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 further qualifications necessary white I mean, like, unless you're French or Spanish, they they kind of had a little bit of apprehension about that. You had to be the very particular kind of French. Yeah, and that's actually what we're going to get into a lot into this uh, in this chapter, which is about Africans as they sought to resist. We're like, well, you know, these uh, London English colonists, they're at odds with France. They're at odds with Spain. Maybe we could see what's going on there. And as we covered uh, maybe two or three streams ago, there was settlements in Florida, namely around St. Augustine, that were, um, you know, much more favorable to free Africans than uh, many of the other colonies from which they were escaping. Do you want to watch it? I found a 10 minute video that was actually really cool about, it's called When the Seminole Indians Aligned with Escaped Slaves. Um, I'm running thin, so do you want to watch this? Yeah, no, I just, uh, I wanted to touch on one right. thing that he brings up in the book that he doesn't really like, you know, uh, follow that far. It's only for like a page, but it's this guy, Elias New or now, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce it cause it's French, but like, he's a, oh, he's yeah. a like French guy that like, you know, um, would not convert, you know, um, to Catholicism. And like he spent uh, time as like a galleys guy. I don't know if you remember from when I went off about like the Barbary Coast uh, slave trade, but like mm -hmm. I guess that means that like he was forced to row ships and stuff, right? Yeah. Um. So when he was like finally released, he found his way into New York, and he had opened up this uh, church um, for like the Church of England, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in foreign parts opened a branch in new york seeking to convert the enslaved right um and this frenchman joined them and began going door to door beseeching the oppressed but this was a tough assignment not least because of the accurate perception that converts would face continuing bias even if christian um and what wound up happening was as this controversy was developing the 1712 revolt happened which was all the more troubling since the fearsome coromantes uh were said to be involved and like their counterparts in the caribbean uh it was said that their plot involved liquidating the entire settler class and taking power as rumors flew about the role of missionary work in fomenting rebellion new maintained a low profile which only increased hysteria as his school was blamed uh th there were french-speaking defense witnesses in and of itself were not reassuring irrespective of the content of their testimony so that's why like you know Yes, they're trying to figure out any way they can to get white people to come to the colony. Um, so long as they're not Spanish um, and they're a very particular kind of French and they're not doing anything as like, you know, sensational as trying to convert them to Christianity. Yeah, I, I pulled this up. I was actually reading about this guy, but it was hard for me to get a big read on what he was doing. Um, he uh, probably the most famous refugee in British America at the time because of his refusal to gain his freedom by converting to Catholicism and attracted a wide Protestant readership in both French and English. Um, and this is all the information. It's not really a ton. Um, but, yeah, that's uh, it. For a very yeah. famous guy, there's uh, really not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he cut his ties with the French Protestant Church in New York and converted to Anglicanism. 
uh, Society for the Propagation of the Gospel that appointed him as a minister to black slaves in North America. And he established a first school open to African-Americans in New York City. 1706, he secured passage of a bill in New York allowing slaves to be uh, catechized, which I, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that word wrong, um, which I believe means to like have them convert, right? I don't fucking know. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. Is, is, what is this? Instruct in the principles of Christian religion by means of question and answer, typically by using a catch. That's what I just fucking looked up. Series of fixed questions, answers, or precepts used for instruction in other institutions. Uh, summary of the principles of Christian religion in the form of question and answers used for instruction of Christians. Yeah, I, I guess that's it. All right. Well, there you go. Um, so, moving from there, so you can kind of see how that's playing out. Um, all right. Did you want to watch that video just to give everybody an idea of kind of like uh, what's going on, at least from the Spanish point of view, or why yeah. and how and the process by which uh, slaves were kind of like cozying up to the Spanish uh, Spanish colonies more so than the English ones? Yeah, let's see it. All right, cool. cool, cool, cool. This is actually, um, it's a channel called Weird History, which is actually... A uh, pretty big channel. It's got four million subscribers, and this has a. Uh, yeah, it's got only got one hundred sixty-six thousand views, but still. In the mid seventeenth century, an alliance unlike any that had ever been seen before began to form between Native American Seminole tribes and escaped black slaves. The Black Seminoles were a group of freedmen and runaway slaves living in Florida since as early as sixteen eighty-nine. Yet, despite the fact that their pairing changed the course of American history, the Black Seminoles were, for the most part, forgotten about. So, today we're going to tell you some things you never knew about the alliance between Seminole Indians and escaped slaves. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other Native American or Black history topics you would like to hear about. All right, pack up the car. We're going to Florida. In the late 1600s, Spanish settlers in Florida were in the middle of a serious conflict with the British residents of Carolina, an area which consisted of modern-day Georgia as well as North and South Carolina. And as a result, they needed a fort that could act as a buffer to protect them. So in 1681, Fort Mose was founded, just north of St. Augustine. With so many escaped slaves seeking freedom in Spanish Florida, the settlers decided that the fort should be run by freed black men. In total, 38 men ran the fort and established what is now recognized as the very first all-black town in North America. When Florida was later ceded to Britain in the Paris Treaty of 1763, the freedmen were no longer welcome. Many were forced to flee to the Seminole Nation, thus beginning the Seminole Nation's alliance with the Black Seminoles. The relationship between the Black Seminoles and the Native Seminoles was, to say the least, complicated. The two groups were partners of chance who joined together as a team when it was to their benefit and parted ways when it wasn't. They shared much of their respective cultures with one another and further unified themselves by practicing intermarriage over the generations. They were also one of the first American communities to navigate the murky waters of joining two different ethnic groups, something that would become a bit of a motif in American history. While they weren't recognized for it back then, today's scholars are finally beginning to acknowledge the important strides that these two very different groups made by joining together. The home of the Seminole Nation has changed many times and spans across several states and countries. After the War of 1812, both the Native and Black Seminoles moved from northern Florida into the southern and central areas of the state. They were doing their best to get away from encroaching white settlers, which turned out to be a prudent decision. In the early 1820s, a large group even had to escape to the Bahamas. After the Second Seminole War, which ended in 1842, many Seminoles and escaped slaves were removed to yet another new territory in Oklahoma. However, others chose a different path and ended up in Texas and northern Mexico. Around 1816, General Andrew Jackson future seventh president of the United States was charged with the forced removal of any runaway slaves who were being sheltered by the bands of black Seminoles. 
To accomplish this task, he adopted a strategy that mostly consisted of the burning and raiding of Seminole villages. These attacks, as you probably aren't surprised to learn, quickly became the catalyst for the first major conflict between the white settlers and the Seminole Nation. Although the black Seminoles fought back, Jackson captured the Spanish-held cities of Pensacola and St. Mark's. Ultimately, the Spanish would end up ceding Florida in 1819, as well as giving up their claims for sovereign Spanish rule in Texas. From 1835 to 1842, the Seminole Nation once again found themselves waging a brutal war against the white settlers who wanted their land. As it happened, the land that had been granted to them by the United States as a reservation turned out to be very desirable to plantation owners looking to expand their operations. Not realizing how valuable the land was when they gave it away, the settlers demanded it back, and the resulting conflict was absolutely devastating. Not wanting to leave their home, the Seminole tribes fought back against the Indian Removal Act. It was a costly war for the United States, with estimates of the expense ranging between 40 and $60 million, which today would be well over a billion dollars. Expansion is a mighty fine thing. Sure, we gotta grow, but not at the expense of the things this country was founded to protect. Many, if not most, scholars including those who focused on African-American studies, surprisingly overlooked the significance of the Seminole Uprising for a long time. For nearly 150 years, it was all but forgotten, as most history books focused on the role of the native Seminole fighters rather than on the escaped slaves and the black Seminoles who fought alongside them. From 1835 to 1838, roughly 385 to 465 runaway slaves and 500 to 800 black Seminoles fought alongside their native Seminole counterparts in the Second Seminole War, forming an even stronger alliance, one that would eventually win them their freedom. On May 28, 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act. It still took officials a number of years to actually evict the Seminoles from the land. Many other tribes from across the American Southeast were also forcefully relocated into an area west of the Mississippi that became known as Indian Territory. You Indians, get out of here! 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 The Seminoles, however, were marched to New Orleans, where they were placed on a boat that would take them to their new land at Fort Gibson. Having been promised their freedom if they went along, a group of 250 Seminoles, including a large number of black Seminoles, agreed to the terms of their journey. The lowest classes of white people are flogging the Cherokees with cowhides, hickories, and clubs. We are not safe in our house. After the Second Seminole War, white plantation owners quickly realized that it wasn't going to be in their best interest to admit that they were defeated by black rebels. In an attempt to appease both sides, the black members of the rebellion were granted their freedom, and the incident was purposefully swept under the rug of American history. Although slaves had been granted their freedom in other situations, this was the only time before the Civil War where freedom was granted to runaway slaves. When slavery was still being practiced in the southern United States, the plantation owner's grip on power was paramount. Plantation owners had to maintain their control over slaves to ensure the continuation of their businesses and the lifestyles that they had established for themselves. This dynamic plays a large role in explaining why the escaped slaves who fought in the Second Seminole War were largely forgotten by history. It was in the plantation owner's interest to downplay any occurrences of slave rebellion, particularly those that were successful, so that other captives wouldn't try it themselves. A system of euphemisms was used in newspapers to get the story out without any African-Americans realizing what had happened. What people don't know is that enslaved people always resisted, always fought for their freedom. Born in 1812 and also known as Juan Caballo, John Horace was a black Seminole who grew up among the Oconee Seminole. As a boy, he learned to hunt and fish and became proficient with both bows and arrows and rifles. In contrast to many of his contemporaries, John also learned to read and write in several languages. He is known to have a working knowledge of Spanish, English, and the Hichiti tongue spoken by the Oconee. Among other things, he would go on to lead the largest slave uprising in American history during the Second Seminole War. He also met two presidents, was an advisor to multiple Seminole chiefs, and later served as a distinguished officer in the Mexican military. 
Toward the end of his life, he led his people from Florida to northern Mexico, where he provided them with a safe place to live, a place that his descendants still reside in today. John Horse led an incredible life by anyone's standards, and by the time he died at age 70, he had accomplished his dream of securing a land where his people could live freely. The stars twinkle as the dirge-like ancestral music of the Indians echoes through the solemn stillness of the night. The Chickasaw, Choctaw, Cherokee, Creek, and Seminole tribes were considered to be the primary Native American nations that white settlers and African Americans had relationships with. The first four held slaves for various purposes, and in most cases they worked on large plantations or farms. The Seminole relationship with blacks, on the other hand, was quite different, and there was far less chattel slavery involved. Instead, black Seminoles were viewed as free men. Although they never seemed to gain complete acceptance into the Seminole Nation, they still enjoyed far more rights than African Americans in Indian country did. It can sometimes be difficult to determine who was part of a particular ethnic group and who was not. The question becomes much more complicated when a historical reparation payout of $56 million is added into the equation. We're referring to a conflict that arose in 2002 when the federal government awarded a huge settlement to the members of the Seminole Nation in Oklahoma. The situation had already become tense with regard to the acceptance of the Black Seminoles into the tribe before that happened, and the money didn't make things any easier when it came to determining who got what. Many of the people arguing for inclusion pointed out that there has been a long history of intermarriage between the Black Seminoles and Native Seminoles, and that the settlement should be rightfully shared. The Black Seminoles attempted to sue the federal government for their share, but in 2004, the United States Supreme Court ruled against them. The court held that the suit couldn't move forward without the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma being joined as a party. However, the Seminoles of Oklahoma refused to join, and as a sovereign nation, the court could not force them to. So what do you think? What other... Yeah, I sincerely doubt that uh, the removal was a bunch of dudes just going into their house with rifles pointed up, being like, hey, get, get out of here. <laughs> you, you gotta go. Sorry, I was muted. I was saying things and no one could hear me. Um, so that kind of establishes kind of like the um, difficulties, I guess. I guess you could call them difficulties that the... Um, english uh crown and the english uh colonial colonies were facing in terms of their other colonial competition from uh the spanish to the south and to the french in the north in like the in canada quebec uh what would be what would become quebec, um, quebec. and again this is out of the book. However, the ill-defined nature of whiteness could easily allow for the infiltration of putative or actual foes of London from Madrid and Paris, not to mention Dublin and Glasgow. I think we've talked about that a lot. The Scots and the Irish, they don't like them. They need them, blah, blah, blah. But now it's becoming more of a contentious issue with France and Spain. Yeah. Um, so an interesting way that that uh, kind of presents itself. Um, I, 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 this gets brought up. I don't know if I tried finding like a good video of this and there wasn't really anything that I could find. But another example of this all playing out is within this um, Lefebvre. Is that how you say that? Lefebvre? Lefebvre? Uh, Charlestown Expedition. Um, it was a combined French and Spanish attempt under Jacques, Jacques Lefebvre to capture the capital of English province of Carolina, Charlestown. As you know from this book, Charlestown is like the literal, they call it the Ellis Island of slavery. Um, yeah. Whether it's from Africa, whether it's from the Caribbean, from wherever, a major, 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 major percentage of, Af of sl African slaves went through charlestown this is the epicenter of slavery in the american colonies so you have france and spain in a joint effort to take this and in this they even included um indigenous people as well um Gerald Horn in his book does say that there was African um, armed Africans with them as well. I checked in the um, 
in here. I, there's nothing in this Wikipedia page about any Africans, but I don't think that that's much of a stretch. If you already knew what was happening in St. Augustine, the Spanish for decades at this point were arming um, runaway slaves and otherwise free black men. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I don't think it is a far uh, logical leap whatsoever to um, understand that they would likely have some Africans with them as well. But at least here we can see that there was um, indigenous uh, individuals on this uh, crusade against Charlestown. Yeah, not to mention, like he even says at the beginning in the introduction to the book that, uh, or was it the preface that, um, you know, a lot of the documents that he's using, a lot of the sources that he's citing are just like recently discovered stuff. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, so it might not even have like trickled its way onto Wikipedia yet. No, probably not. Right. So now we can see this actually materializing. Uh, the the nightmares of the um, English settlers and um, the nightmares of an African alliance with France or Spain or who who whomever um to come and uh destroy take over exterminate the english colonies is actually becoming somewhat of a reality um so outside of that you know curbing these dangerous imports meaning african slaves enraged merchants and planters who profited from this dirty commerce while bowing to these businessmen could threaten colonialism as a whole so this speaks again like you know what i mean like this isn't like a monolithic situation you do have european powers being like hey we need to uh throttle the amount of africans that are coming in and they do this with certain type of taxing certain type of um tariffing everything like this, all types of uh, limitations, uh, having to have certain amount of servants versus X amount of slaves. There's a lot of different like legal bureaucratic ways of throttling the amount of slaves that are coming in. And this is extremely um, upsetting to the businessmen that are, uh, you know, um, profiting handsomely off of their um, grotesque industry. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, somebody in chat, once you're balls here said blackbeard sailed out of there so it's not incredibly unlikely that you know you've got people illegally bringing you know slaves into uh port right um he's even talked about it in previous chapters about how like you know at every attempt to try and throttle the amount of slaves going in here um it's evaded anyways or they'll go in through like you know some other territory and go up river and sell you know people right um, right and then then there became a black market as well um, yeah where people were smuggling slaves into the united states or what would become the united states um outside of the laws that were being established um so that's why it's not really helpful when someone's like oh uh this state abolished the slave trade in this and that it's like okay well there's a, for one there's a difference between abolishing the slave trade and abolishing slaves i think we've right. noticed that throughout this book too is that there are certain states even um Brit england as a whole at one point was like we're done with the slave trade but if you have slaves you have slaves like slavery was not abolished the slave well, trade was made illegal well it's one thing to end like you know people from profiting from it it's another thing to end the people that rely on it like for profit in which case that means that like the state in order to like you know free them and take away the property right because remember this when we talk about liberalism and we talk about like you know the the foundations of liberalism it's centered around property and if people are considered property right then that means that the state would have to uh what's the word uh reimburse you for the loss of that property i.e mm -hmm. slaves mm -hmm. which the english did have to do and as we learned uh on s wednesday that apparently that that debt didn't even get paid off until 2015 by the english taxpayers yeah so uh cheers for that <laughs> So the next thing I have here is on the Yamasee War. Do you want to get into that or do you have anything else that you want to discuss before we go there? 
Um, I just have like this one part, like that's highlighted. And I'm sparse on my on my uh, paraphrasing here or my uh, my <laughs> segmenting. Well, I mean, like the other thing is that like he kind of um, Gerald Horn bounces around from like years oh, to years. Real quick, that's that's true too. Not even just the yeah. uh, English people, but Haiti. The reparations that Haiti had to pay for the slave revolt has been like part of like the economic crippling of that country it's like one of the most impoverished places in the entire world and yeah. france is still like you owe us for the slave thing that you the, the the noble resistance that your people had against us enslaving you in a colony I'm trying to see the french government finally acknowledged the payment of 90 million francs in 1888 and over a period of about 70 years haiti paid 112 million francs to France, about five hundred and sixty million in uh, twenty twenty two. Jesus Christ! And most important, we had a precise price tag in the one hundred and twelve million francs, or about five hundred sixty million today. I'm trying to see if they are still paying France. Here's a video from where they talk about it. It's only three minutes long. Okay. Haiti country is often in the news for all the wrong reasons, abject poverty, natural disasters, or even a president who was gunned down while asleep. Now, the New York Times has published an investigation on what could be at the heart of Haiti's misery. Reparations the country had to pay to its enslavers. In 1791, the largest slave uprising in history occurred in Haiti. 21 years after the country's independence from France, a French warship accompanied by two other ships sailed into Port-au-Prince and gave Haiti an ultimatum. We can now bring in one of the journalists who worked on the piece for a year, Constant Mayu. Thank you very much for joining us here on France 24. Thank Tell you. us what happened in 1825 and what was the ultimatum France gave Haiti? So in 1825, which is two decades after Haiti won its independence on the battlefield, uh, beating Napoleon's forces, uh, the French came back with a fleet of warships and told Haiti, basically, you have to pay us an astounding amount of money in reparations to the former French slaveholders, or we will actually make uh, war again. Right. Um, Eddie was in a very difficult position. Eddie had not been recognized as an independent country by the U.S. and by many other Western countries. It not only was it not recognized by the U.S., but during the time of that, I believe Thomas Jefferson, I know Thomas Jefferson wrote about this and was like, uh, this cannot go on. Like, this is like bad news. This is very bad for business and everything that we're trying to do. Um, we are not in support of the Haitian Revolution. So you're muted. You're muted. You're still muted. I don't know if you can hear me, but you're muted. All right. So like Thomas Jefferson, right? Everybody always likes to bring up like, oh, uh, you know, he um, had kids with one of his slaves and blah, 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 blah. Right. You know, and that brings up like a whole different conversation about like consent and like, can a slave consent to their masters? the whole conversation about power dynamics and stuff like that but those kids that he had right with his slave right he then put into slavery so he gave no fucks making sure that like the first ever um what's the word uh um like um sanction embargo whatever the hell you want to call it right he had no issue issuing that as like the first one especially against haiti as like the first like proletarian revolution um you know i i'm like kind of probably misquoting vj prashad but it was like the first proletarian like revolution that overthrew the state um entirely at that time under President Thomas Jefferson's presidency, the United States cut off aid to La Ovator and instead pursued a policy to isolate Haiti, fearing that the Haitian Revolution would spread to the United States. I believe I actually first read this in Domenico Lacerdo's book, Liberalism, where like it takes a bunch of like quotes that you can take of Jefferson um, kind of feigning towards, you know, the liberty of all men and maybe even like offering some kind of lip service to abolitionism. But um, then it shows um, the the two-faced nature the insidious nature of liberalism and like the um um and the uh 
those who who posit liberalism and then what their how their actions contradict their philosophy well yeah because in his time right and because he's not an abolitionist right slaves are not people right so when you're saying things like all men are created equal and things like that um we don't view black people as people those aren't people so when we say all people all men you know obviously we're not referring to them right but we're talking about thomas jefferson not like you know uh, that's the thing is he's supposed to be different from a king he's supposed to be like you know all men are created equal right yeah. so i i don't I, I don't know plus like you know you always have people that like go after like you know thomas jefferson saying like oh he like um has his own version of the bible that like you know he edits out like you know all the fantastical stuff and it's just reduced to like you know the moral ethical stuff right yeah i mean thomas jefferson on behalf of the subversive history interactive podcast <laughs> and history um you know team he can suck our dicks <laughs> that's how i feel about thomas jefferson so um let's uh let's return back to our regularly scheduled content here i do always love um having a little uh intermission where i can tell the the ghost of thomas jefferson that he can suck my dick um as enjoyable <laughs> as that is we do have content to cover and uh <clears throat> you know we we got a business to run over here you know what i mean right. we got a schedule to stick to um we're uh we're uh uh so going going ahead right uh all of these strains and more came to a head in charleston's vicinity in the early years of the 18th century already the slaveholders in 1708 had decided what was thought to be unthinkable in case of actual invasion it was said it would be necessary to have assistance of our trusty slaves in service <laughs> against our enemies settlers were in a desperate bind doubtlessly they feared actual invasion by spaniard or frenchman or the indigenous or a combination thereof but how did concessions to quote trusty slaves comport with the routine brutalization of africans or were settlers simply trapped between the internal foe that was the enslaved and the external foe that threatened invasion yep i had that part highlighted the the trap between the internal foe that they enslaved and like so it's like you're building this internal enemy from uh you know enslaving and abusing them and exploiting them right. but also even through this slave trade almost directly and indirectly you're also building up your external enemies as well and causing even more conflict with them right like e either like you it's uh it's so weird that like you know th they they are fully aware that like this is going to blow up on us at some point yeah this is a powder just, like, trying to figure out like what's the right um like ratio here maybe we just got to find that golden ratio of like <laughs> the perfect balance yeah and but like that's the thing is that you always have to have more slaves than settler oh, otherwise God. what's the point right yeah, because it's like the amount of settlers that you need has a necessary amount of development and, uh, you know, um, resource extraction either by the land or from human capital of some, some, some kind. So it's like the more people you bring in, the more houses you need. The people that come here, they want to work. They need land. They need a plantation. They need like land to work. But by having land to work, I mean having slaves work the property that you own right just like the the which is pretty much the uh the material reality of philosophical liberalism at least during that time is that you are granted private property that you then you can also have the private property of other human beings work right but like because here's the thing though is that I, i'm not sure if you're referring to either like bringing in other or more europeans or more slaves but like your interests as a uh, uh as a settler right on the mainland is completely antithetical to the interests of the people you're enslaving 
Like the people that right. are being enslaved are like, I don't want to be a slave. But that's still right. what they were trying to do. They were still like, you know, uh, you know, at the end of their, at the end of their wit, at their wits end. And like, you know, oh, now we have, you know, the indigenous that are coming back to punish us for what we've done with them. Now we have, you know, the French to the North and the Spanish to the South and all of them. And it's like, you know, um, now maybe we should weaponize these African slaves who are so trusted and loyal to us. Please, you know, help us fight because, you know, we'll instill a fear that they'll be worse than we are. Um, and that's actually kind of a um, good time to probably get into the Yamasee War, um, which is an interesting example of all these factors coming in. Dude, I'm sorry. I've yawned like 20 times in the past You're 20 good. minutes. Um, I am fucking exhausted um my i did not finish my finals uh did i give you one uh, did i catch you um i did not finish my finals i had three finals this week and i just finished them yesterday morning right before my girlfriend's birthday that i had to go out all night for and then also i got <laughs> tattooed for like six hours on friday yo i saw that that shit looks fucking fire i need to go to your fucking artist and shit because like the color is just like yeah he's pop. really good um so I have like absolutely been running myself ragged. Um, so if you see me here yawning, just uh, just know that it's not because I lack interest in the content being discussed, but it's just that my physical form can only fucking handle so much, um, so much activity. And uh, I'm gonna drink some coffee. And we have the Amasi War. Yamasi War or Yamasi, Yemesi, was a conflict fought in South Carolina, uh, 715 to 1717, between British settlers from the province of Carolina and the Yamasi, a number of, and a number of other Native American people, including the Muskegee, the Cherokee, the Catawba, the Apalachi, the Apalachi. Okay, I, I'm not gonna try to you, just uh, just various uh, Native Americans. <laughs> various. various, various. Also, oh, another yeah. aspect to remember throughout all of this, right, is um, like the the frightful reality of the late years of the number of Negroes has much increased in proportion to that of white people in Carolina. The number of white men being computed at no more than one thousand five hundred to two thousand, and their Negroes at fourteen or fifteen thousand. So, like. That, that's so many more. Like, there are <laughs> 14 to 15 times more. It's so many more. Yeah, that's how we're going to quantify that. It's so many more. I'm not good at math. It took me like three or four different tries to get out of the, like, you know, math that you got to do in order to get your degree. So let's just, let's just go with like, you know, 15,000 divided by 1500 oh shit no i did it wrong yeah that's like four slaves you know 4.4 repeating for every you know <laughs> for every white set <laughs> um one second um, so yeah, and then, um, you know, it's not only the slaves that need to be, um, feared in terms of their, um, you know, r insurrectionist, uh, wrath, but also the, you know, let's not forget that we have, you know, the Europeans have also committed, um, innumerable crimes against the indigenous populations. And as we can see here in this situation that happened in 1715, Native Americans killed hundreds of colonists. It's nice when they hit the hundreds. A lot of these insurrections get like, you know, uh, you know, get nine here, get 20 yeah. there. Yeah. Like you know, that one like, in New York was only like, what, like five people? What was it? What was it like five dudes? I think like nine like people died. I think like nine of the colonists died. It's nice here in hundreds. It's like, all right, there you go. <laughs> um, but uh, killed hundreds of colonists and destroyed men of settlements. They killed traders throughout the southeastern region. Colonists abandoned their frontiers and fled to Charlestown, where starvation set in as supplies ran low. I, I wonder, you know, and you know, I don't support anybody starving or being 
well i wouldn't say they don't support anyone being murdered um but it's kind of because like this is such like a little microcosm compared to what like indigenous people were subjected to just for like expansion and just for profit and just for like the um annexation of land yeah um that this is like th what happened in this little colony in south carolina is like nothing but just to like kind of like you know give it back a little bit just 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 a little yeah where starvation set in and supplies ran low the survival of the south carolina colony was in question the entire south carolina colony went into question during 1715 the tide turned in 1716 when the Cherokee sided with the colonists against the Creek, their traditional enemy. The last Native American fighters withdrew from the con conflict in 1717, bringing a fragile peace to the colony. Um, so I, I guess it was, there was another tribe that uh, sided with the colonists. Okay, yeah. Which is things that always, there's, there's, that, that happened throughout a lot of the conflicts, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's like a, almost a, a constant throughout like a lot of, you know, w well into like near like the, the, the Civil War that like wow. there would be tribes like, you know, like the five civilized tribes that that one video was talking about, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're, because they consistently thought like, okay, maybe if we just like, you know, do go through its deal with them, they'll finally like fuck off and they'll leave us alone and they'll let us like, you know, have our land. And it just, it's never enough because, you know, it's just a constant, like, you know, but it's one of the situations where like the, the frog in the boiling pot of water, it's like kind of too late by the Slow, time. Exactly. Before you realize it, it's already yeah. too late. Right. Right. Yeah. And now like, you know, like today they're, they're like uh, debating, I walk and like, you know, fucking, court in the supreme court right now and whether like indigenous people have like a right to the their own children in their own communities um it's like a whole long story um but like you know i know that uh five four podcast and decolonize buffalo um cover it pretty extensively and also red nation i, I feel like i don't bring up red nation nearly enough but um, those are like definitely like, you know, resources to use in terms of like five, four, if you want to know more about how the Supreme Court is bullshit, uh, decolonize Buffalo and Red Nation are like excellent resources when it comes to wanting to understand contemporary, uh, you know, indigenous issues today. So um, Gerald Horn says, you know, the quote, whole province was, quote, in danger of being massacred by their own slaves. It was reported mournfully through the failure to succeed did not quench the militant thirst for freedom of the Africans. For in 1721, the monarch in London was informed that Africans again had come close to, quote, nearly succeeding in a new revolution, which would probably have been attended by the utter extirpation of all your majesty's subjects in this province. There was a number of extermination plots, one in 1728 and yet another in 1730, which almost came to pass. According to one spectator on the scene, there was a, quote, conspiracy among their Negro slaves to have murdered in one night every white man in the province, to have taken such of the white women as they liked, and the Negroes in each family should murder all the white men of the family they belonged to. But still... Africans kept arriving in Charleston as if someone had a death wish. And then that leads me to the quote that I have here. Yet the colonists, as best they could, were grappling with an incompliant problem. How to exploit the labor of Africans shamelessly, but not to the point where they would rise as one and destroy them all. So it's it's like what walking a tight tightrope here. It's an, it's yeah. it, it, it's effort and futility to continue to just it's like it, you can actually find this in a lot of um capitalists just just throughout the 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 history of capitalism like you might look at like climate change and be like why are you know companies um you know engaging in this like they're getting rich but like to the detriment of the entire planet like if they'll eventually die because of this and it's like you know that lust for profits that perversion that happens to the human condition through this like individual quest for profit accumulation um really does blind people and this is like example to this too it's like um there's a lot of people that can see the writing on the wall that the more of these africans that we bring in and treat like this they will they are coordinating they are intelligent and they are um you know capable of um inflicting a great r revenge upon us 
but no, we did. We, I need the money. We have to keep, we, we, it's necessary for, to keep the profits coming. Just, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's almost a one-to-one -to, -one to, to, to climate change because yeah, that's a, that's what I was thinking about the whole time that I was reading this is the co comparison to climate change, like, or that against all logic, you know, when right. profits continue against all like better logic. Well, I mean, like I, I even talked about, and I hate to say this, dude, I hate to say this, right. I hate to use slavery as an example for like, uh, against the free market right but you can even see this with slavery like when the rac had more of like a collective control over the slave trade it was better administered it like if you're going to engage in slavery at least they had like a greater oversight to like the the functioning of the colony and then once you put it into private hands the whole thing spins out of fucking control because nobody could fucking reel it in whatsoever or have like a you know a collective structure over it it's just like you know um I hate like even like using that as an example, but it's like the same dynamic seems to play out. I mean, like I, I you understand what I'm saying? Like that probably yeah, sounds insane. I, I'm not like supporting it. I'm just saying that like even that like that yeah. that that example of like the the free market running wild and to the detriment of pretty much everything around it, even uh, even occurs with us with the slave trade. I I brought this up during the divide series, right? um that like you know i think that what we're seeing right now in terms of our economy where we've got like you know possibly two or three different like viruses just running rampant like there's there's epidemics going on within the u.s that are completely uncurved our infrastructure is crumbling um you know there's like I forget if the unemployment rate is still as high, but like it's hard to even find accurate numbers because they're willing to even take like temp jobs and stuff as like, you know, uh, oh, they're employed, you know. Also, like, I don't think they, they count underemployed people or people that work multiple jobs. Like I know there's a lot right. of problems with, with the employment rate that I read about in my sociology class where like yeah. it's, it's worse than it actually seems. Yes. It's and worse it seems than it, bad. Yes. <laughs> so basically like what, what I'm getting at, you know, is that like, it, it's 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 counterintuitive they're willing to let the problem go along go 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 as far as it possibly fucking can until it blows up on them you know and that's what like you know we're at right now and the so, only thing that you can hope is that you made enough money to get out right that's what these people think and like that's what i'm saying like this is the free market ideology like you know what this is completely unsustainable but i'm just going to milk it and and extract every dollar that i can and hopefully when this thing collapses i'll be one of the people that 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 squirreled away enough funds that like i don't have to feel it yeah ho hopefully you know i'll be the head of barclays and uh yeah. we'll continue to be able to extract labor or, or you know uh some kind of capital from somebody else who you know suffered because of what i needed to make money it's it's all uh, uh, what does marx call it like vampirism <laughs> like it's it, it's it's all it is right yeah, I, I do agree with that, Nonsure sure Balls, is that, you know, it, it, the capitalism necessitates a labor market. So there's the commodification right. of every non-human commodity, but then you also have the commodification of human beings as a labor force. And a commodity is um, requires a, a necessity, a supply and demand. So if there were some kind of like a federally mandated jobs program something that like what happened under fdr in the new deal where there was like an array of like well-paying federally provided jobs it would destroy this this concept of a labor market where there needs to be a degree of unemployed people to set some kind of like a wage that people are going to vie for um because if there was like federal job programs for like the construction of roads and all these other things like i'm sure it's like almost infinite what the federal government could provide in terms of employment like that like unskilled labor could be used all throughout this country but if they were to provide that that means that the, the wages that private employers would have to pay would skyrocket you know what i mean like if you could get a job making whatever 20 dollars an hour 25 dollars an hour working on roads for the federal government like imagine what like mcdonald's would have to pay people right like imagine if instead of 
like you know when you join the military you get sent off to like somalia or something or like you know you end up like being like a drone operator or some shit you you just plant trees or you like you know work on bridges and infrastructure exactly. and exactly. like you know, you're not trained how to use a fucking gun well, yeah maybe you, yeah like <laughs> you're, you're trained how to like you know mix fucking concrete and exactly like, how to exactly. fucking like you know how to how to farm more than anything and like measure ph levels of soil and stuff like this well so and like, like i live in philadelphia do you know what some philadelphia streets look like in terms of trash and shit like that like you could have a federal jobs program to, obviously they and and don't tell me that like oh there's so much red tape to it it's part of community service you, you don't, you don't mind do it. People doing it for free when they get arrested. Why can't, you know what I mean? Like, so it's not like some kind of like, um, uh, red tape issue with like, Oh, what if somebody gets hurt or something like that? Because you already do this. I got arrested and I got put on the back of a fucking trash truck. What, what happens if I fell or got hurt or something like that? So like, I don't think there's any argument from that sense, because what about all those jobs that you're willing to, uh, subject people to for free because of, um, on, because of community service why why isn't it able that if somebody needs a job why can't they just sign up to do those jobs like without being arrested and being forced to do it for free right have you ever you thought know, about that why why can't we have like you know federal programs that take people that are currently working jobs that are reliant on fossil fuels and train them like in every part of the field related to like renewables and stuff because it's just not what they want that's not well, the end goal well and that's the thing there's like an inertia there's like an in inertia industry and we even see that now with this slave thing even though like you can see that the wheels are starting to fall out the inertia is too great it's already has too great of a velocity to turn it back so it's the same thing with a lot of these things like you know look at the fossil fuel industry the the the, the, the behemoth you know oil industry is so huge that even like when like there's scientific developments that are kind of making it obsolete the behemoth is going to keep trudging forward because it has so much momentum like to get to to, to to actually reel that thing in is like almost a herculean task that cannot even be achieved it needs to be beaten into submission right by, by an opposing Somebody, force some shit's gonna have to get nationalized that's all i'm saying yeah but we've reached the point already where even if something were to be nationalized, right, um, the current, like, you know, federal government would just, um, like, you know, export that process or that responsibility to a private corporation that would do it. Oh, right. Like, you know, well, this is this we didn't nationalize anything to begin with. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, you know, the process of nationalization is, um, you know, uh, preceded by a radical change to the federal government right we're having fun here we're having we're, it's, it's such a fun exciting stream so um ba, 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 as ever as ever legislative remedies were devised as if they there were um, a magical amulet right uh though their deficiencies were symptomatic of the colony's weaknesses thus in 1725 as ma it was mandated that every slaveholder with 10 Africans should hire, quote, one white servant man or boy of a proper age, end quote. Well, I don't know what the fuck a proper age is. And they kind <laughs> of monitor over this troublesome property that all, quote, all proper encouragement be given to any merchant, masters of ships, or others who will undertake to, uh, import such white servants rowdy irish or french or spanish catholics presumably did not fit the bill right yeah so ongoing we've we discussed this in the first chapter we discussed it in the last two chapters we're discussing it now this is a compounding issue that is just becoming more and more of an unstable powder keg that the colonists are desperately trying to hold on to while also like continue their path of uh egregious development based on forced labor yeah there's, i think there's a, i have a little quote a little quotey quote on this and even if there had been a desire to curtail the import of angry africans the british did not control the entire mainland and rampant smuggling meant that it was not difficult for contraband meaning slaves to reach 
territory claimed by London. Thus, in June 1719, the first ship from West Africa was said to have arrived with hundreds of enslaved Africans in New Orleans, which was controlled by Fren the French at the time. Uh, by 1721, a steady stream of slave ships was arriving in Biloxi, and by 1737, up the Mississippi River in Illinois, the population of Africans had doubled in five years. So, even like I said, uh, you know, this this insatiable quest for profits, even at the better, um, you know, the, maybe the cooler heads against slavery were starting to propose, um, was just exploding in other areas. It, it just couldn't be contained because now it has been uh, relinquished to the free market. There are those that are willing to continue the, engaging in this uh, disgusting, pra disgusting practice at the detriment of their own colonies um, for the sake of profits. Huh. So they're just like... Uh, this whole thing is a bad idea. <laughs> uh, we're starting to realize that this whole thing is kind of a bad idea. Uh, hot take from the Subversive History podcast. <laughs> Slavery, bad idea. Bad idea. We're, um, we're we've taken a look at the data. No we've taken one's a look, happy here. No. We've read the books. We've, uh, we've, 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 we've piled over the data. And slavery was a bad idea. Uh, we will go on record um, saying that slavery was a bad idea. No, because I was like, look, I'm, all I'm trying to say is that, you know how, like, people a lot of times, especially since Trump and since 2016, were like, you know, oh, there was a time when, like, America, like, made sense or something like that, right? right. This is, oh, and it's not just right-wing people that are always, like, opining about, like, the 1950s and shit. Like, there, there's also, like, libs that are like, oh, remember what it was like under Clinton? And, like, we, we learned that, like, you know, through reading, um, you know, uh, the, the divide, right? And also, anybody here, like, should be aware that, like, you know, the 1994 crime bill was, like, fucking disastrous on, like, you know, communities of people of color and shit. You know, like, there was no great, like, time in America where everybody was having a great time. There's just periods where, like, there are rich, wealthy white men that are making a lot of money, right? Even and if, there are Hickle, some times where they make less money. <laughs> even Jason Hickel talks about this during the New Deal. Even, you know, Jason Hickel from The Divide. I'm sorry. You know, you might not be as intimate in this. I can't, like, speak for all of our, um, you know, everybody in chat. But, like, if you followed us, you know, when we read The Divide, even this, like, like what I would say, like, I mean, you know, we're obviously, you know, sifting, um, you know, sifting for very few diamonds in the rough here in terms of, like, the success of the United States, in terms of, like, like a human humanitarian success. Um, during FDR, which the New Deal with his, like, the New Deal and the Good Neighbor policy might be, like, the high point, I would say, even though that's an incredibly low bar. Even but there, was Jason the high Hickel, point under an apartheid. Right. Jason Hickel even states that, yes, a lot of these programs worked very well. Like, just looking at them as economic policies, we can see that there was a lot of success surrounding this. But this was mostly success for white, straight white men. If you were gay, if you were a woman, if you were black, if you were Mexican, uh, maybe not so much. You know, we, we can definitely look at these economic policies um, objectively and understand that these kind of like state led development processes and federal employment programs. Very good. They work. We should we should revisit that. But also, you know, you can't you can't do it under an apartheid system. And, right. you know, you have to understand that that was not great for everybody. So and that's the thing, like even AOC, like they, they're they're trying to uh, re um, rebrand the New Deal with the Green right. New Deal. So, I mean, like definitely some things that you could take out of that as a positive, but also you have to understand that this is also the guy that was rounding up Japanese people in internment camps and also, you know what I mean, still had, uh, you know, uh, black Americans as second class citizens. Right. Which is also why, like, you know, I favor less the Green New Deal and favor more the, what is it, the the Red Deal, right? That was put well, together by... Right. Right deal is like just a way in which that like uh you know these you know green technology companies are still going to subjugate the congo and many many other yeah. countries bolivia anywhere any place where you can get cobalt and uh lithium and uh all these things that like this is just another way to uh drive profits of massive companies that are in on the green revolution and uh you know continue to you know destroy countries such as the congo and have children working in cobalt mines right 
Right, right, right. Which is why, like, you know, under the guise of this is green, this is good. You, 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 you and your liberal sensibilities should feel very good about what you're contributing to the world right now because you, uh, you have uh, blood minerals in your car now. Right. Not that you, yeah. not, not that you never have it because you always have, but you can feel a little better. You can go ahead and your little consumerist sensibilities and your liberal uh, mindset can feel very good about this. You did, you did a good thing because you bought an electric car. Right. Which is why, like, I think that um, these things should not be coming from, you know, lawmakers that just it, it, sh <laughs> it shouldn't be coming from uh, people that have historically like fucked up that have historically like left people out. And I think that it should come from um, things like this. I think that the red deal is like you know where it should really be coming from but that's just me and that's like a whole other stream for like a whole other day and like you know we'll, we'll talk about that eventually because i really do want to cover like something like this you know or at least like you know um glenn coltard's like you know red skin white masks you know i feel like it's a very good uh contemporary you know uh follow-up to uh france Fanon's, you know black skin white masks um you know Whatever. And the, Gerald Horn even says interrogating, quote, whiteness could easily lead to a tugging of the loose threads of class hierarchy that this racial category otherwise obscured, thereby helping to unravel the colonial project as a whole. It was as if these purblind settlers were emulating a child who, in covering her eyes, imagines that no one in turn, that in turn, no one can see her too right um and that's that's perfect I, I think it was like red falcon fni um i don't know if like they're in here or whatever maybe one day they'll see us but like you know i follow them on twitter and they're often in like a lot of other stream chats and stuff but they bring up how instead of thinking of things like you know um the the the, the differences right uh, uh that that like you know come with how capitalism has oppressed or colonialism has oppressed indigenous people and uh you know black people africans and people outside of the u.s that like it's important to understand how class can be stratified right and like i think that's a much more materialist understanding right you know of these issues rather than um rendering everything down to uh, what has been co-opted as identity politics um not even just by like you know uh liberal but like also the the right wing of liberal you know the the conservative you know movement in america and by a lot of these uh snake oil salesmen grifter fucking larucheites and all these other people yeah absolutely yeah, and I mean, really, I mean, part of what we're reading now is the, um, you know, creation of this identity politic category of black and white, or at least like the, you know, the installation of it into the cultural zeitgeist. Um, <clears throat> George Washington George Christ. Washington Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, didn't die for our country so you could blast me the great american revolution brother what's brother. up boss thank you thank you for coming it's good to see you <laughs> um so um the next thing i had uh some stuff on or at least i didn't really have stuff i, I wanted to bring up um did you did you get to the part about the samba Reve rebellion yeah i tried finding stuff on that on youtube and a lot of it is just about like samba dancing but i did find a one minute 42 second uh video that is in i that think i found the same one as you and it's literally the, the top 13 facts it's a it's literally just a robot reading this paragraph from <laughs> So, I mean, I found that same one and I decided not to even include it. And also, did you notice that in this and in, I think it was the Yamasee, both included a picture of the Haitian Revolution? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, I guess because they just don't have a picture. So they're just kind of like, this is as close as you're going to get. It probably, it yeah. might have looked, it might have looked something like this. It might have looked something like this because like nobody at that time that was even aware of it gave a shit about it enough to yeah. do anything about it. And we didn't uh, teach it in school to the point where it became some kind of like a, you know, a revisited topic that we yeah, were just even like aware a historical of. black hole in the collective memory of this nation's history. 
But um, so in continuing in our effort to, uh, you know, highlight or spotlight, I don't know, highlight spotlight. I don't know which I like better. The, uh, you know, many, many, many slave insurrections that occurred in the United States. Uh, we Now we will talk about the Samba Rebellion, which was a purported slave rebellion described by French historian Antoine, Antoine, Simone Lepage de Prats in History of Louisiana. The revolt is said to have taken place in 1731 in what was then French Louisiana. Um, contemporary with the Natchez revolt, which we'll go into in a moment, um, it was personified to its alleged leader, an enslaved man called Samba Bambara, a member of the Bambara people from West Africa. While Lepage gives a brief recollection of the events, which was more a conspiracy to revolt rather than an actual revolt, his information is not verified by any existing existent official documents. Wow. Um, the African Gordon Samba is reported to have participated in a number of revolts after being enslaved in Africa and during transit to Louisiana. The insurrection was due to play, take place June 1731 and was said to have been revealed to the colonial authorities after an argument between an enslaved woman and a drunken French Marine. Um, 1936, crisis plan to kill as many whites and to keep enslaved on the later scholarship was questioned the details about the revolt, including whether Samba had participated in prior uprisings and if the Bambara were a homogenous of a group as the contemporary reports imply. Okay. Not a ton of information on that. We can go to this one now, which I believe has, a, this has much more of a, appears to be much more historical verification, uh, than the other. But like I said, if you remember what it said, um, this was uh this was contemporary to the um samba revolt so this was happening right in the same time around the same area all in the french colonies this is uh this is a quote from joe biden that i just want to read real quick listen jack <laughs> we don't exactly <laughs> wanting people to get the right idea so we don't talk about stuff that might you know inspire them to throw off their change and smash the ownership class listen jack listen jack i Come was on, around man. for that I knew De La Pratt's. <laughs> All right, guy. He's a bad dude. He's bad Pratt's dude. was a bad dude. <laughs> La Pratt's used to come around me at the pool and look at my leg hairs. With, with a chain on. <laughs> with a chain. That fucking guy, man. All right, we're having fun. Um, so the Natchez Revolt, or the Natchez Massacre... It was an attack by the Natchez Native American people on French colonists near present-day Natchez, Mississippi. On November 29th, 1979, the Natchez and French had lived alongside each other in the Louisiana colony for more than a decade prior to the incident, mostly conducting peaceful trade and occasionally intermarrying. After a period of deteriorating relations and warring, Natchez leaders were provoked to revolt when the French colonial commandant, Sour de Chapart, demanded land from the Natchez village for his own plantation near Fort Rosali. The Natchez plotted their attack over several days and managed to conceal their plans from most of the French colonists who overheard and warned Chapart of an attack were considered untruthful and were punished. In a coordinated attack on the fort and the homestead, the Natchez killed almost all of the Frenchmen while sparing most of the women and enslaved Africans. Approximately 230 colonists were killed overall and the fort and homes were burned to the ground. Um, I don't know if it's this always just like pretty much like always being like um, put in a more favorable light, but it's so consistently that I read things like that. Like I was recently reading um, about the um Hararo and Nama people of uh Southwest Africa who were pretty much exterminated by German colonists um in the 19th century and in the war that occurred between them you read these same things that you hear about the Nama and the Hararo during their raids of German encampments um they're actually very particular about who they're killing um they're actually um save you sparing quite a bit of women children even some like uh non-administrative white personnel and things like that even like not even like killing like random farmers or slaughtering their cattle and like meanwhile you hear about what the germans are doing the herrera and the nama is like the most vile shit that could ever happen to like any like innocent innocent civilian <laughs> what were they what were, the, what, what were the what were wearing yeah that's what i was gonna say <laughs> God damn. Uh, what, were they, what were they wearing? Uh, 
Are, are they sure they didn't entice them? <laughs> It's so dark. It's awful. I know. I know. It's terrible. It's terrible, the things that we say. But The French in New Orleans, the colonial capital, heard the news of the massacre. They feared a general Indian uprising. Oh, no. And were concerned that the Natchez might have conspired with other tribes. They first responded by ordering a massacre of the... Do you know how to pronounce this? What is it? Chowacha. Hang on. What? Cha... I have no idea how to hell pronounce that, man. Okay, I'm sorry. Who had played a role in the revolt and wiped out their entire village. The French and their Choctaw allies then retaliated against the Natchez villages. So here's another of those instances where there was like, you know, a uh, opposing tribe that was willing to work with, their with the French, which is also yeah. just kind of going into like the overall um, volatile nature of all of this like kind of like settler colonial project where you have african slaves indigenous people many different you know not, and not a monolithic you know just indigenous people but like many many separate indigenous peoples that also have their own issues between one another and then you have french people then you have english people then you have spanish people then you have english people that are like well we need to like bolster our numbers so we're bringing scots and welsh and irish and this and that and it's like you know all these people have their are trying to like um capitalized on their own opportunistic situations to um develop in their own way and like pit one person pit one people against the other and you know then stab them in the back and this and that and it's like you know the same thing with what this whole chapter is about where as african slaves are starting to conspire with french and spanish you also have indigenous tribes that are against the french and indigenous tribes that are conspiring with the french it's like just like a non-stop just like um a clusterfuck clusterfuck of it's people a cluster just like, like just he like, really wasn't exaggerating in like the first chapter where he's talking about it's it's literally a miracle at all that like this project <laughs> like la has lasted as long as it did i know it's actually fucking terrible that we've sitting here for these three chapters and we're just like oh man you gotta watch out this is a powder keg this is unstable and then they are able to actually repress it and inhumanely um you know oppress people for long enough to like still like you know come out of with a settler colonial empire it's just sad that they didn't get their the the just desserts for the ridiculous actions that they were taking yeah it kind of would have been cool if like the yamasi like were actually able to pull it off and like yeah. you know just... or like kind of like a situation with the seminoles where like you know friend uh, where um uh, na uh native tribes and um africans that escaped or were freed kind of banded together and were able to foment some kind of like a anti-colonial revolution so um i'm just gonna quote this next part just because like my favorite like uh a person of historical record is mentioned again in this chapter country held together with duct tape and repression <laughs> oh shit <laughs> <laughs> fucking um <laughs> Yet yeah, amnesia was about as sound an approach as any other, given the depth of the problem faced. Present laws, it was announced sadly in 1723, were insufficient to punish their secret plots and conspiracies of Africans, all of which seemed to be proliferating. Thus, in 1729, William Gooch, the leading <laughs> colonist, warned, I'm sorry, I'm not going to miss any chance i get to quote the gooch so william gooch the leading colonist when the africans near the banks of the james river schemed to flee to quote neighboring mountains to a site where quote they had already begun to clear the ground with a cache of quote arms and ammunition end quote an attack was mounted against these africans and they were subdued though their ambitious plan quote might have proved dangerous end quote as they mimicked the quote, the Negroes in the mountains of Jamaica, end quote, whose ructions had proved so inimical to the needs of the settlers. For it was, quote, certain that, end quote, even a very small number of Negroes was once settled in those parts would very soon be increased by the accession of the runways of the runaways and proved dangerous neighbors. In short time, in short, as time passed and Africans poured into the colony as slave trade reforms 
asserted themselves. The colonizer had accomplished the feat of making the mainland seem more like Jamaica, not less, thereby eroding the import of the Great Trek. So it's just like they literally had this huge, gigantic landmass and somehow still fucked it up. Well, like I said, you know what I mean? You have all these competing people and people with business interests that are irrespective of any kind of like, inshallah. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? That is irrespective of any, of any other kind of like con notion of a greater good. You know what I mean? That your own personal accumulation of wealth is, uh, you know, um, blinds you to any concept of the greater good. Sounds like Cope from Spartans might have made up to justify clapping some slaves <laughs> to make a point. I mean, yeah. All, all of this, it, it literally is a miracle that any of this, it's just rebellion after rebellion. Every other page is a different rebellion. Every other page is like a different like you know um revolt of some kind or or slaves running away into the mountains and like starting a community that get just gets clapped after like a month <sighs> um let me see what else i got here that's the end of the notes that i have um for this one um you got anything else that we're uh, to to kind of discuss on this? I mean, yeah, like the the rest of this is literally like you know, um, just numerous examples. Um, that like, was kind of like where where I was in reading this is like we, we we've established the, the 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 base points here, and then like everything else is just like more and more evidence to substantiate it and it's like what point is it redundant? But uh, if you have more, like obviously, like let's let's go over because we are still running short time wise so he says actually the plans of africans may have been more far-reaching than even the worst case scenarios envisioned it's like as if it couldn't get any more worse <laughs> <laughs> um at the same time virginia authorities were forwarding uh to london a quote box full of roots and barks that would quote cure the most inveterate venereal disease end quote and that had been a quote secret in the hands of a negro praise was lavish since only mankind will be the better for his knowledge typically in the process of being appropriated without compensation unacknowledged was that african knowledge of roots and barks also proved useful in numerous poisoning plots that arose in coming here I'm pretty sure that, that that's a lot of the way if you read about the Haitian revolution, there was a lot of like poisoning and shit like that that happened as well. Yeah. Slave masters would prefer you to just assume the history has been a long unbroken story of willing subjugation. But and when, yes. And when it, and when they weren't willing, uh, it was for their own good. You right. know what I mean? Like, you know, there was a task of civilizing that the, uh, slave masters, it was like a, that there's some kind of like, um, dualistic benefit to slavery where not only do I get to like make money off them, but also I'm giving them the civil, a civilizing, uh, a civilizing effect by by my through the subjugation well i mean like what, what i was gonna talk about was the, the the fact that like you have especially in the last couple of years we've seen like a lot of movies talk about slavery right everything from like black panther to like all the the historical dramas like the one with like matthew mcconaughey and then there's 12 years of slave and then uh i'm trying to think there's like a, a bunch of them right like nation of some other thing ulysses or something i don't know i'm probably getting it completely wrong but like t tell me you, you've noticed that over at least like the last 10 years right i haven't seen like really any of those movies the only like one that i've seen maybe in the past 10 years is django right django is an excellent example right that like it's only in fantasy right that we are granted any kind of depiction of slaves murdering slave <laughs> masters even though we have plenty of historical examples we we've literally just been just just been page after page of them no uh, no, no, well, no 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 absolutely uh, all not. of your contributions have 
not only been hilarious but they're also appreciated um we're like kind of dwindling to towards the tail end here so we we need a little uh <laughs> we need a little hot air to keep us up at this point but no like think about it like we have all of these historical examples. They're willing to make movies about all kinds of other, like, you know, off the wall shit, right? Um, or like even something like Django where it's completely based in fantasy, right? But nothing like this is based off of real historical events where the slave master dies, right? Where there's revolt, rebellion. There's not a whole lot of this. And like the one that I can like think of, I didn't really see it, but I, I remember it came out with like Matthew McConaughey, right? Where he like a white guy leads the slave revolt. <laughs> what movie is that? Oh, fucking God damn it. Like you're going to make me try and have to spell Matthew McConaughey. You're going to do that to me. You're going to make me spell McConaughey. <laughs> Shit. Kevin Costner. The, is... the free state of Jones. Okay. It's, uh, it's in 1863. Yeah. Oh, and you know what? Even what? in like leftist circles, people talk about John Brown all the time when right. like a white guy is like responsible for like these kind of like slave insurrections. Right. Uh, but um. But not Toussaint you know, Louverture. Not Toussaint. Not my dog Toussaint. No. Who not, really? Not, not this guy. I'll, what, I'll Antoine before. Simon Le Père uh, Duprat. Yeah. Like, and that would, the Haitian slave revolution would be an amazing movie. And honestly, if I've always said this, if like there wasn't such like a heavy bias in like, you know, the United States and the film industry, the Cuban revolution would be like one of the greatest movies and most inspiring movies that could ever exist. And like, unfortunately we will never get that because of like the current state of like media. Oh, uh, commentary says something similar about a movie in the seventies. Um, yeah, you got me, man. I, I don't know that one. I don't know um, shit about 70s. Nothing. Sorry. Other than, yeah. <laughs> Superfly. <laughs> Not like a black exploitation film. <laughs> I mean, but like, that's the thing is that it, it's only when like the spectacle can be used as a means of placating people, right? Or it has to be based entirely in fantasy. It can never be like based off of like real historical things that have happened you know what i mean well you know um the real history i don't know i don't want to sit here and like pontificate on um on that subject like i mean obviously we could say that it's a intentional um situation but also we could say that it's just kind of like what the tide of um you know liberal understanding of history is you know what i mean like yeah. is it something that's being intentionally done to deceive or detract from this real history or is it just that it's like we are in a um eurocentric liberal centric um society and this is where the inertia of society like pushes us to and it's and may, maybe some of it is is voluntary but a lot of it might be subconscious you know what i mean like this is a way that that we see the world this is the way that i saw the world for many years until i picked up a couple books or I, until i had a couple people like tell me about some things and then i started watching some perenny videos you know what i mean like you know i had a you know this you know subconsciously white supremacist view of the world a, a subconsciously eurocentric view of the world until someone started presenting me from it with another perspective well that's why i think that like and i considered you know, myself non-racist like i, I, I was like you know how you just said it was like an unintentional like subconscious white supremacy yeah I think that like that's all the more like reason for me to believe that like it is on purpose. It absolutely is. Okay. I, I think that it like preventing stories like this from being told and being like venerated and like within the popular consciousness, like yeah, they have nothing. Like, like you know how we always talk about like propaganda, right? And like the the way to navigate propaganda is like who does it serve right who benefits from that propaganda well think right. about it. who benefits from there not being a a movie about the haitian revolution or about these slave well that's not propaganda that's a lack of propaganda you know what i mean, I mean like yeah, yeah but like you understand what i mean is that like you know like it's somebody going to hollywood being like 
oh, here's the Haitian slave re revolt. I want to make a movie about this. And they're like, no, this is like some, this isn't something that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and, and I'm taking a more pathological approach to as to why that's not being highlighted. And I believe it's because this like Eurocentric concept of liberalism is so ingrained at this point. Like we're even maybe like, you know, a century or so ago, there was like a heavy intentional bias towards these things that now it's much more insidious and it's a much more um, pathological um, fixation on these these subjects. Knowing about like uh, Edward L. Bernays and like, you know, uh, his, his influence on just like American culture in general, yeah. I don't think anything can be left up to like just uh, happenstance, you know what I mean? Or, or just like coincidence that like it lines up with like this white supremacist project, even if it's not one where like, you know, uh, it's like a, a, a visceral one. It's not like, you know, every other movie we're watching is like basically a fucking clan rally. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm open to all of that being true, but I'm also someone that doesn't like to jump to conspiracy without evidence. Like, you know, there's that, that saying, and I, I don't know if it's a very, I, it might be kind of a liberal saying, but that's fine, is that it's like, um, do not attribute to malice, which can be summarized by um, stupidity, stupidity or like or like something like that. Like, so it's like, you know, and maybe not even stupidity in the sense, but it's like, you know, we live in a cloud of, um, you know, american exceptional eurocentric liberal democracy and you know there's probably many people that gravitate towards certain certain things just because of the inertia of culture um and it may not have like a uh overarching intentional direction it may just be because we are all imbued with this from birth um and eventually it takes on a life of its own and um you know obviously there's there's exceptions to that you know a lot of the war movies that have to do with like iraq or the middle east in general are like intentional propaganda like i think there's a lot of evidence of like that being like extremely like always being incredibly favorable to the like the heroic sacrifices of the veterans and that they're always fighting for freedom and democracy and that the 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 insurgents of the middle east are uh barbaric um, you know, ISIS, you know, this and that, and, you know, this is a purely altruistic endeavor. Like I do believe that there is actual, and obviously our first time I talked about, you know, CIA black propaganda. I talked about, right. um, publishing houses and information research departments that are completely set up by, um, intelligence agencies for the purpose of proliferating, um, um, influential media to, alter how people think so actually maybe i'm just being you know but maybe i'm being uh, completely disregarding that um everything that i evoked in that previous stream so you know uh, that needs to be taken into consideration again is that there is a lot of evidence that this stuff is happening yeah i mean i forget i think it might have even been ross publica in here um talking about like you know that what was that that phrase you used to don't don't uh confuse malice for the what of like stupidity uh, let me let me look at what it is it's something like that or it might have been the guy from east is a podcast cena i think his name is uh hanlon's razor is an adage or rule of thumb that states never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity no, I think that that was a lie made up by malice. I, I think that <laughs> I think that was a way for malice to to get off the hook. <laughs> oh, I thought you said Maoists. No, 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 not Mao. Maybe I don't know. Maybe Maoists. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said that was a lie made up by Maoists. Yes, that's that's Maoist Western Maoist propaganda. <laughs> see john stockwell about that what who is john stockwell do you know who that is operation intercept uh we got it we got an operation wait this guy you want me to see this guy I'm, I'm just kidding. Obviously, we're talking about this one. Mm. 
in search of enemies that's like such an interesting thing like like you know like manufacturing enemies essentially right like you know what i mean like oh, yeah like the enemy should be at your door there should be a present risk of enemies that you need to be combating and like you know this is suggesting like we're in search of enemies we well i mean I, I was just listening to blowback earlier and uh like they're quoting colin powell talking about um yeah oh i'm down to i'm down to kim il sung and fidel castro i'm running out of villains yeah pretty much che, che died in bolivia malice has pr doing overtime <laughs> Che died in Bolivia. Yeah, and of course he's a CIA guy who spoke about his time working with the Nicaraguan Contras. What do you mean, Sam? Look, there's there's only so much like like hard drive space at any given time, all right? Like <laughs> I'm losing childhood memories for this. <laughs> um but no, but uh, uh, I don't know if you if you remember um, what um, that book that um, we we were talking about this on one of our first streams. Um, just kind of like what you were saying, Sam. Uh, Philip Agee is like a similar individual um, for this book inside the company, where he uh, a ex CIA agent, CIA agent um, details his experience in CIA and is like very critical of U.S. foreign policy and you know all of these things except this guy actually has a bunch of like uh claims that he's like working for the soviets or like the or cuba or like you know the kbg or something like that and he was like a plant or something i don't know look at that pat look at that he's gonna post it in the discord for you uh, must, must be nice <laughs> i've literally sent you the invite <laughs> but yeah everybody if you're not watching this on mobile and you're watching um this like you know on your computer or whatever um right below the screen we do if you just it's it just says discord just click it it'll it'll send you an invite to the discord you can be in the discord it's oh, also don't we have a youtube channel now yeah, yeah yeah i just recently uploaded a lot of stuff to the youtube i'm gonna add that um at some point to the series of links that are right underneath the screen that you're watching us on right now um we've got almost everything on there hopefully um like pat's video because like streamlabs is definitely or Streamyard is not picking up pat um like at i can all. see myself in the bottom all right so as long as like you see it like hopefully it's picking it up i yeah. i like you know i've got like three different windows open to like see the 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 twitch one the stream yard one i've got a pdf open i've got another browser open looking at wikipedia <laughs> so hopefully it picked it up um and it'll be up on the youtube soon enough and that way for everybody that like you know just uh difficult schedule hard to make time to to watch us live you'll be able to you know watch our old episodes because we're i think this is technically like a very serialized twitch stream you know <laughs> bbc is full of 007 wannabe journalists so um i'm kind of at my conclusion here what do you think johnny do you have anything else i mean like you know uh would you want to just 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 so that like you know we make the like you know i guess uh three hour mark do you want to burn another half an hour or do you want to just get out of here at like eight um i think i gotta oh, kind of get out of here because i'm having like uh i need to get food in me I, this has been one of the most stressful right. weeks of my life so, um, yeah all right, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll free you um but before <laughs> we do you want invigorated for wednesday um now that i don't have any schoolwork to do for a little while and uh it's my intention to focus on this much more um uh, one of my much more central focuses as opposed to something that just falls yeah. into like a third position behind work and school so, and maybe fourth under diablo 2 resurrected um <laughs> and, uh, i can uh, <laughs> you, you want to tell them about like what our plans are for the rest of this book 
Sure, sure. So we're hoping that we can turn up now that I'm not in school and we can now start reading two chapters at a time because we all re we both realized that this is becoming redundant. We wanted to take it slow in this one because we had very little previous knowledge on reading on this subject. But now that we feel a little bit more comfortable getting into the content, we're going to start trying to knock out two chapters at once so that uh, we can get through this book hopefully within the next three streams. And then are we gonna are we gonna expose what we're gonna read next? Are you ready to let the yeah yeah know? fuck it yeah. Probably something that we should have started with, but um, we are going to be reading uh, as a little break from this highly, uh, you know, complex issue. Um, we'll be reading Black Shirts and Reds by uh, Michael, I think it's pronounced Perini. <laughs> Perini, <laughs> right? Um, no, Michael Perini. Uh, we will, the great Michael Perini with his, um, you know, um, trademark Black Shirts and Reds. Um, kind of like a quick book, something that we've both read before, um, a subject that we are somewhat more familiar with than, um, you know, these, this to these topics of slavery in the 1600s and 1700s. So um, we're going to kind of have that as like a buffer between probably the next bigger project that we do after that, but just something light that we can get through, have fun with. Um, we're looking forward to that. Yeah. And then I, also, yeah. I mean, are we, are we still... You know, we're getting towards the end of 2022. Our intention in 2023 is to add another day streaming. And the day that we're adding is not going to be like a heavy book related thing, but it's going to be just more of like me and Johnny fucking around, just talking about whatever, talking about current events, have it, talking with the chat, anybody, anything the chat wants to talk about, maybe even look at memes. Like it doesn't have to be anything serious. It could turn serious. It could turn into a complete joke. We could just be hanging out, but just having one day that isn't so strict strictly um following the schedule of reading the books so yeah i hope it just devolves into pat playing magic the gathering and just me just like badgering him showing or him diablo like, I've been playing a lot or of diablo. Recently, yeah. magic or diablo yeah it'll probably just be diablo it, it'll just be like let's, let's you're gonna be watching pat play diablo while we just like bullshit about like whatever is going on in the world because there's like no shortage of bullshit yeah um, exactly and, and it happens to us a lot on this like a lot of times we'll get sidetracked and be talking about something <laughs> and we'll get into like an impassioned conversation about some random topic and we have to be like oh fuck we gotta we gotta get back to this uh to this chapter here no we're gonna continue to be a very educational twitch stream we're gonna continue to be very book heavy we're just giving you an extra day of our week right to watch us just hang out <laughs> All right. Well, I have to pee very, right, very right, bad. Go, I'm also go, go. very, very hungry. I love you guys. Thank you so much for the support. Uh, Johnny, I will talk to you soon. All and right. then get back with us uh, Wednesday night, and we will be getting further into the counter-revolution of 1776. Love you, buddy. Love you, too. Bye, guys. Bye. All right. So who we got? Who we got tonight? Who we got? Who's up in here? No, I'm not doing what Matt had me or not. Yeah, Matt had me fucking try and rate street fight radio and their shit just like wasn't working. Um, I think uh, for right now, I'm going to send y'all to what the fucking bullshit. I'm going to send y'all to horse. I hope my buddy horse is doing good. Um, so yeah, it's the, the, this next year, it's, it's going to be pretty lit. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot. All right. But like, I think that we're going to be the first stream to literally go, not just like a grand overview of black shirts and reds. We're literally going to do like how we've been doing things either chapter by chapter or two chapters at a time. And we're going to make sure that we have, are just loaded with peripheral stuff, videos, all of it, you name it. And uh, I'm sure that all of you should have probably read Black Shirts and Reds by now, but ask yourself, when's the last time you actually read it? So, uh, Lal Salam, stay strong out there. Um, we'll see you guys, uh, what is it, today's Sunday? We'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>